Good afternoon. <laughs> now I'm told I'm on mic. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Northeast Regional Secretaries Award Ceremony. My name is Lori Pietropoli, and I'll be serving as your MC today. I would like to take the opportunity to welcome leadership from across DHS, our US CIS colleagues, invited guests, and most importantly, the awardees who are here today that we will honor and celebrate. For the first time, the Secretary's Awards are being presented at regional ceremonies across the country as we celebrate a month of recognition, acknowledging the exceptional work being done across the department by DHS employees. In doing so, we will tell the stories of their accomplishments, contributions, and in some cases, heroic acts, all in the name of public service. We are honored to serve alongside these employees and to have this special time to recognize their work. At this time, please stand and join me in welcoming the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Honorable Alejandro Mayorkas. Thank you. Thank you, please. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's I who stand uh, for all of you. You know, we are um, presenting the Secretary's Award this year uh, in offices throughout the country, not just because of the challenges of the pandemic, but uh, quite frankly, because we are extending to deserving recipients, about eight to 900 of them, uh, the awards. And just by the sheer number, uh, we thought it best uh, to really celebrate the recipients where the work, so much of the work is done is out, out in the field. And we are indeed uh, recognizing people who have accomplished so much, but I think there's a very important underlying principle. And that is that the accomplishments of one cannot be done without the contributions of many. And so in celebrating these deserving individuals, we're actually celebrating everyone. And uh, you know, this, this month is public service recognition month and we're really launching this month throughout the department um, a month of recognition that kicks off an enduring day in and day, day out culture of recognition not just internally but externally to explain to the american public just the extraordinary work that all of you do on their behalf and i um if i say nothing uh, of importance this visit let me just say this, which is so incredibly important, and I hope that you'll all remember, and it's just thank you. It's thank you for everything you do. So I'd love to jump in. I have to say, it's great to be back in Vermont. The last time I was in Vermont, I was the director of US Citizenship and Immigration Services. I visited the Vermont uh, Service Center. Lori at the time, I think was in Chicago at that point, or were you still in headquarters? Oh, what year would it have been? <laughs> Laura may remember. One or the other. <laughs> it will be one I or the other. I was taller. I was, uh, <laughs> uh, it was a whole different thing. Uh, Dan Renault was the, um, uh, the service center uh, I director. was in Chicago. Um, uh, Laura was uh, the head of contracting, if I remember uh, correctly. I remember... Uh, having an employee engagement, and I came to the service center with what I thought were all these grand ideas about what we could do for the uh, for the workforce. These big, you know, changes, and somebody raised and, and I presented a few of them, and they they landed with a little bit of quiet. And I remember one uh, of our colleagues uh, raising his hand and saying, "You know, could you?" Um, could you get our computers to boot up faster in the morning? <laughs> it was like standing ovation. And uh, um, sometimes the little things uh, matter. And, and what you are able to accomplish with um, sometimes not the best of resources um, uh, is really remarkable. And it's the job of the secretary and the job of headquarters to get, to get you the resources. Uh, that you need to do the job in a way that makes you most proud. And um, uh, whatever the challenges you are, uh, the work you do makes us proud every day. So thanks again. Thank you. Are you ready to begin? Ready to begin. All right. 
So today we recognize individuals and teams who have made outstanding contributions to DHS and our nation. During this ceremony, I will share a brief description of the recipient's honors before I ask the awardees to join the secretary here in the front to be presented with the, with the award. After receiving the award, we'll have a short conversation with the secretary to learn more about the meritorious work of our employees. Our first award is the Secretary's Meritorious Service Silver Medal Award. This award is the second highest award presented by the Secretary and recognizes outstanding leadership, superior public service, or unusually significant contributions to strengthening Homeland Security. New to this category are uh, grade levels 11 and wage grade 8 employees serving in administrative, technical, clerical, and general support positions. This award may recognize a body of work regarding remarkable innovation or notable resourcefulness and diligence that improve the effectiveness of one or more DHS missions. The silver medal is awarded to COVID-19 Funeral Assistance Task Force, Julie Blansiak, FEMA Recovery Division, New York, New York. For the first time in FEMA's history, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2021 and the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 enabled the COVID-19 Funeral Assistance Task Force to provide financial assistance for COVID-19 related funeral expenses incurred after January 20th, 2020. Approximately $1.1 billion in funeral assistance was provided to individuals who have incurred COVID-19 related funeral expenses. The Funeral Assistance Task Force's Efforts have helped alleviate financial burden to impacted victims in our nation during these unprecedented times. Julia Blansiak is unable to attend today's ceremony, but please all join me in, welcome, in congratulating Julia on receiving the Secretary's Silver Medal. Our next award is the Secretary's Award for Innovation. This award recognizes individuals or teams that employ a strategic and enterprise-wide approach to strengthen the Department of Homeland Security mission and its operations. The nominees should exhibit an ongoing record of high standards of achievement and innovation. The work of the nominees may have resulted in superior performance and or significant operational improvements in the manner of which capabilities are developed and deployed. The nominees' achievements and contributions should include maximizing the effectiveness of people, processes, and technologies, providing wise stewardship of resources, and enhancing the capabilities of component and DHS employees. The Secretary's Award for Innovation is awarded to the Case Scanning Portal, CSP, Stacks Enterprise Team, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Service Center Operations, Essex Junction, Vermont. This team showcased innovation and collaboration across the directorates within U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services by facilitating the swift necessary movement of a predomin predominantly paper-based caseload into an electronic format as the result of an unexpected loss of one of its primary processing centers, ensuring the agency continued to deliver on its mission while expeditiously adopting new, highly effective, and efficient processes. Please join me in welcoming to the front to receive their award, Lynn Boudreau. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Alexandra <laughs> Collins. <laughs> Tiffany Dukeshire. Tiffany, congratulations. David Gilbert. Becky Hightower. Thank you, congratulations. Thank you. And Robert Perkins. Congratulations. And unable to be here with us today are team members Michelle Marble and Timothy Smith. So we'll start the count. Whoops, well, let's go. 
So let's start the conversation. So Tiffany, uh, USCIS unexpectedly lost one of its primary processing centers making electronic case processing a critical need. Can you tell us what the team did to deliver a solution? Sure, I'd love to, thank you. <laughs> um, so first I wanna start out by saying Vermont Service Center has really uh, been a leader in ingenuity for as long as I've been there. Um, our officers are often tasked with finding uh, innovative ways to um, solve problems. So after we got over that initial shock of losing a building and trying to figure out what we were gonna do, um, we set up a temporary office location and some scanners and we started scanning our physical files. So these are files that are uh, mailed into the service center from the applicants and petitioners, and normally we adjudicate them in a paper format. With a lack of building and space being an issue, we wanted to quickly digitize them and get them to our officers electronically. So there was a technology that was being tested out, the case scanning portal. It was kind of being piloted um, across some centers, and we said, how can we leverage that to do what we need to do? Um, so we started scanning files, we uploaded them into the case scanning portal, and that's when the real work began. <laughs> so then we had to um, quickly and, and effectively come up with processes and procedures to take all of these electronic digitized files and um, figure out how to get them to officers electronically, track them, move them, all of the pieces that go along with adjudication, only now we're doing it digitally. Um, so we did that. Uh, we had a great group here of uh, people across uh, Vermont Service Center, as well as headquarters, um, IRIS, OIT. Um, everyone pitched in. It was all hands on deck. Uh, we figured out new processes. So we basically reimagined how we were going to do our work. The next step was getting our officers on board with that. Um, this was very different for them to look at a, a scanned PDF of a, of a case and adjudicate that way. Um, at the Vermont Service Center, we held a lot of engagements. And so during that, we shared information. Uh, one of the biggest things that contributed, I think, to our success is that we involved all of the employees. So these informational sessions, we said, please tell me what's working, what's not working, what can we do better? Um, and all of that feedback, you know, funneled up through our team. We brought it up to headquarters and um, we developed those solutions. The next step was, okay, Vermont you know, figured some of this out along with the, the other folks helping us. How do we get this out across service center operations? Um, so we held additional informational sessions. Uh, we worked with um, service centers across the directorate. We shared our procedures. We learned some best practices. And um, that was initiated across all the service centers. So it was, it was absolutely a team effort with this group, with all of the employees that gave us feedback, with headquarters staff, with IRIS, and with OIT. So a quick question that I should say for your benefit and everyone's benefit, um, the certificates um, are temporary. We have beautiful awards to provide to our recipients, but uh, with the pandemic and the manufacturing backlog, they're, they're in the mail. Um, so so um, do you all come to work, you know, as, as always, taking a look at how one could do one's job better. Do you, on your day-to-day -day work life, do you come and do you have that lens of looking at what you're doing and how it can be done differently? And is that a talent that you apply to your work or is that a quality that you have in your lives as a whole? Well, I can say for me, I was leading the process improvement team at Vermont. So I went into work every single day saying, how can we do this better? Uh, what can we do better? Um, but I'd say Vermont Service Center as a whole has approached all of their work doing that. Um, I, I know it, not just in, in work life, it's in my personal life too. I actually have a funny story because when I was like two years old and my mom sent me to go get something, she's like, what else can you get when you go do that? so that you're only making one trip. Um, so I can say I, it's pretty ingrained in my life at this point. How about others of you? Yeah, um, I think what comes to mind is um, it's quite ironic that uh, the Tabor facility, which was obviously Gil Tabor's brainchild and, and the, and the, the uh, concept of service centers, um, it was the sort of decommissioning of that building that um, was a catalyst for us to get to service center now. 
Um, and, and it really was our employees. Um, we we kind of laugh and say we were building a plane while we were flying it at the same time. Um, but I think they could see the vision. They knew where we were. They knew where we needed to be. And at this point, they're reaping the benefits. So we have employees, um, all our 129 cases are in an electronic format. Um, the officers are coming in maybe once, twice a month to pick up cases. Their homes um, are not filled with <laughs> boxes of files. Um, and they've been able to take advantage of remote work, um, some of them being able to move um, to long distance more than four hours from the center. So definitely the employees um, were the key, and they are now reaping the benefits. Once upon a time, I used to know what a 129 was, <laughs> but I just want to make that perfectly clear. Well, congratulations, and thank, thank you all. Thank, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you to the CSP Stacks Enterprise team. Our second secretary's award for innovation is presented to the Flood Response Capability Team, U United States Coast Guard, Michael Keene, Sector, New York, Staten Island, New York, for superior service, innovating a deployable flood response capability for simultaneously occurring catastrophic flooding events. In response to historic levels of flooding and an unprecedented, unprecedented demand for flood response capability due to increased weather events in the United States, the Coast Guard Flood Response Capability Team rapidly designed and acquired 12 trailerable flood response kits consisting of inflatable flood response boats, engines, and supporting equipment able to be towed by pickup trucks, pickup trucks and deployed to multiple catastrophic flooding events occurring simultaneously. Furthermore, they innovated the specialized policy, tactics, training, and procedures, and delivered specialized training courses and protective gear that enabled more than 224 flood responders to conduct catastrophic flood response missions. Please join me in welcoming to the front of, to receive his award, Michael Kane. Okay, so Michael, what does this mean for the Coast Guard? Thank you very much. Um, Secretary, you, you probably realize that we've been doing actually flood response for quite a long time. Um, and in the uh, Western Rivers, um, the local sectors were developing their own capabilities. They were using their own personnel and training, uh, just on the job training to be able to respond. So um, this actually really stepped off when Admiral Schultz was the Atlantic Area Commander and when he responded to Harvey and saw the, the absolute need for the Coast Guard to develop a more formalized process, uh, not just in the capability, but training um, and ensure we aligned across uh, all different agencies. Um, so we started off with, uh, as was said before, you, you need to get to the people who've done it. I, I've never did that. Um, and so what I have done is reached out and you'll meet um, uh, Mr. Bradford Clark next next week. I'm one of 12 people getting the, the award, but there are a, a ton of others that actually, you know, really helped make sure this got to where it is today. Um, and so uh, we went and did a lot of ot &E with different types of uh, platforms. Um, sorry, what is OT&E? Uh, operational test and evaluation of uh, because what if if everybody's heard all the, the stories on the news and you, and you hear, you know, the Cajun Navy uh, down in the rivers and uh, down on the Gulf Coast, um, we integrated within them uh, along the rivers. So we did a lot of work to be able to make sure we had the right capability that can be deployable across the country. And we didn't want to have it all staged where we were within the flood zone. So these 12 containers have all the boats, all the equipment ready to be able to respond at, at any given time. Um, and then we needed to make sure we had the training. So uh, over the last several years, we've had about 300 individuals, between 250 and 300 individuals go out to Indiana for a floodable city, do the training, get certified, have the right PPE. Um, and so now we can effectively respond um, at nationally instead of using the consistent local units on their own to be able to, uh, you know, help in a catastrophic incidents our situation. So it's really a force multiplier. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and what's the next challenge ahead of you to, um, to bring the innovative skills uh, to bear? 
So I, I think the, the continued training and making sure that we know, okay, 300 individuals is nice, right? As we continue to expand, how do we uh, tap into the, our Coast Guard Reserves? As you know, we, we utilize them uh, significantly to be able to uh, be a force multiplier whenever is needed. Um, and I think they, that would be a great uh, opportunity and as we continue to expand it, sir. Well, congratulations again. Thank you Thank very you. much. Congratulations. <laughs>
in the work that they do. And it, it, it comes to mind here, although it is relevant to the awards we've granted to the recipients that we've recognized thus far, it comes to mind because the U visa, you know, is for victims of crime who, despite their vulnerability in being undocumented or otherwise unlawfully present in the United States, are able to step forward as witnesses, provide assistance to law enforcement, not without peril uh, uh, to their own uh, well-being. And to be able to recognize that vulnerability, recognize the assistance they've provided in delivering accountability to perpetrators um, and extending temporary re relief when more sustainable relief is not yet available is brings that principle of impacting people's lives, no matter what we do, and no matter your role in whatever we do, that just brings it uppermost in my mind. Um, how, how long have, uh, has each of you uh, worked in the U visa uh, arena? Because I will tell you the bona fide determination is something that is um, praised with unanimity uh, across the country, both by law enforcement, by uh, individuals in the community as advocates. It's really something, and it's a space where unanimity is sometimes elusive. About 12 years. About 12 years in the U visa. Yes. And how did you come to the U visa program? Um, I came as a supervisor. <laughs> My first assignment. Wow. That's like jumping right into the, uh, <laughs> into the thick of things. And you've stayed with it ever since. And what makes you uh, proudest? <laughs> here, just speak right into you here, right, right into you. Uh, the resilience of the people that we see in the petitions. Absolutely, I completely agree with Mike's point on that. Um, I started doing you related work uh, about eight years ago as an adjudicator of U-based adjustment applications. And uh, for the last five and a half years, I've been on the council team at the Vermont Service Center giving legal advice related to the VAWA TNU programs as well as other benefit types. So um, you mentioned resilience. Um, you know, I have a photograph in my office. Um, back when I was a, um, a federal prosecutor, it was uh, the, our practice, we were very proud of it, to put our plaques and the like. Um, that just was the custom in a US attorney's office. So when I became the deputy secretary, I put my pl plaques up and uh, uh, my wife uh, visited my office for the first time. She looked around and she said, the last place in the world I wanna be a shrine to you. And so <laughs> I, the next day I said, okay, these are coming down and I put up things of uh, importance to me personally in my personal life and my professional life, although uh, the pictures of my parents I, I've had, um, you know, uh, right behind my desk since 1997 when my mom passed away. Um, but there's a picture that I have um, of a young orphaned Haitian boy, orphaned in the January 2010 tragic earthquake that struck Haiti. And at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, people developed an emergency relief program for those Haitian orphans. And this young boy, maybe 10, uh, the photograph is of him running through Miami airport with a beaming smile on his face to meet his new adoptive United States parents. And I think of that because you mentioned the word Resilience. You know, we see a lot of, in our work, we see um, a lot of challenging things, but we also can see a lot of beautiful things. And here was an individual who had lost, a young kid who had lost his parents, and yet he had the resilience, the, the spirit in him to understand how still to smile. And um, it speaks of resilience. And between the challenges that people encounter in their lives and the beauty of tomorrow, the, the opportunities of tomorrow, is all of you. Thank you very much and congratulations.
Our next award is the Secretary's Award for Volunteer Service. And this award, award recognizes significant contributions by DHS employees who serve as volunteers with nonprofit or community service programs or activities. The employees' contributions should be direct, sustained, and have meaningful results for inter individuals or the larger public good. Jin Liu, Transportation Security Administration, Law Enforcement, Federal Air Marshal Service, West Orange, New Jersey. The senior federal air marshal identified that a lack of accurate translation was an impediment to communication between law enforcement and his local Asian American community. Senior Pham Lin not only volunteered his language skills and he is fluent in Chinese dialect in, in the Chinese dialects of Cantonese, Mandarin, Sawa, and Hakka, but also developed a database of foreign language speakers among his peers who could provide translation services for local law enforcement. Senior Pham Lu's actions in his community not only recognized the needs of underrepresented groups, but built goodwill and trust for law enforcement. Please join me in welcoming Jin Lu to the front to receive his award. So Jin, we are in awe of your language abilities, and we know that you have a story to tell. Well, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for sending me for this um, volunteer service uh, award. Without this award behind it is a lot of support from especially my family and especially my wife. So at home, she got to take care of a lot of stuff for me because I had to travel around and do a lot of support. And also, I, I thank my uh, SAC, Curry, and my supervisor. Without them, this war is not going to be here. Well, I, I because I'm fluent in um, four dialects, and because two years ago, pandemic hit, and uh, social media and also uh, news media have a lot of incidents, hate against Asian. So. It touched my heart because elderly men or elderly women got hit for nonsense or hideous crime that they committed, and I want all those criminals should be prosecuted. So in my heart, I asked my SAC, I say, sir, can I go into my local community to assist um, uh, local law, enfor law enforcement to be use my language ability to help them to translate, to investigate, because most of the victims in all this crime doesn't speak English. I just use my language to help them. Maybe it can be a lot of people like me, brother and sister Asian law enforcement can come out and uh, help assist federal, local, and state. That's why all my purpose is. But without, especially my family and my, my office, without their support, this is what not happening. So that's all I can say. Thank well, you. That, um, <laughs> so, so you've said a, a, a great deal. Um, so how did you come to learn so many different dialects, some of which are more prevalent than others? Well, I grew up in, in China um, since 13 year old. And then I, after 13 year old, I immigrated to the great country, United States. And I've been here 40, uh, three, four years. So my languages started from school, college, and also Cantonese is part of uh, um, Guangdong province, which is everybody speaking um, on Cantonese. Mandarin is the uh, national language. And Sawa is one of my village I grew up with. So I, I literally just learned it from parents, grandparents. And Hakka is one of the town, next town to have the great population. And I also gained from there. So here are my four dialects. <laughs> and um, and uh, when did you become a naturalized 
United States citizen? Uh, I will say probably 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I'm trying to figure out when I became a naturalized <laughs> citizen. Um, let us not forget what is the greatest country uh, in the world, the United States of America. We have two immigrants speaking with one another right now, uh, both um, employees of the United States Department of Homeland Security serving the country that gave their families so very much. Um, you know, the newspaper, um, uh, of course, captures so many of the challenges and the divisiveness um, that uh, is uh, addressed uh, every single day. There's a tremendous amount of unity that I think we don't celebrate uh, enough. And here is a shining example of the greatness of this country. And if you um, would be so kind to come up so that everyone can recognize you as well, because indeed is, it is so very often a family. Congratulations. This is my wife, Patty. Without her help, I mean, because I'm a law, uh, federal air marshal, we do a lot of traveling, and because without her help, my kids at home, we will be falling apart. But <laughs> thanks again. Thank you. Presentation. Thank, you. Thank you. I think we have seen that, yes, Secretary, you are right. Everybody here in this room and, and everybody who is watching the live stream, they have all changed lives every day. So thank you to all of our awardees and for sharing your talents, making a commitment to public service and representing the department in the highest manner. Let's have another round of applause for all of our awardees. <laughs> And at this point, it's my honor to turn the podium back over to the secretary for some closing remarks. Um, I hope people will stick uh, around. I'm going to take the microphone off and we can just mingle and get to know one another. And I just want to say thank you again for everything you do. It is um, noble. It is life changing. Uh, and I hope you uh, are as proud of yourselves as we are of you. And so thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today for today's special occasion. And this does conclude our ceremony. Let's have one final round of applause for everybody. Congratulations. Thank you. Let's hang out. <laughs>